Well, peace for a Christian is different than peace, maybe in the world sense. Actually, the scriptures say it's not as the world gives. So peace for a Christian is an abiding sense that God is in control, he's present, he's at work. And so when things go badly, you still have peace. Doesn't mean you're happy all the time. When things go well, you still have peace because it's in trusting in who Jesus is, not in what's happening around us. We'll never have perfect peace in this life. The best we can do now is stay connected to God's spirit moment by moment and he is our peace. It's, it's like this spiritual satisfaction of knowing that God is with us. So experiencing peace doesn't mean that life is perfect. It doesn't mean that there aren't storms. It doesn't mean that there are times when we experience stress and trial. But what it does mean is in the midst of that, we can rest in knowing that God is still present. To have true peace, is to know that no matter what you're going through in life, God is with you and actually he has plans for good. There can be a great peace that comes from knowing you're not perfect, but you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God himself and you can use your gifts to make a difference. There's, there's a peace even in the midst of a flurry of activity because you know you're centered in what God has for your life. made us beautifully different. I mean, you think about how every single human being, I mean, the obvious one is fingerprints. You know, God's made us all with different fingerprints, but it goes, goes well beyond that. Think about music, the different tastes and styles of music. Even people who like a certain genre of music like it in different ways, and they like different artists. It's, God, God just made us different than each other. I, I think of God has given us different taste buds. So if you ask a person, do you like food spicy? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you ask my wife, do you like food that's spicy, she's going to give a different answer than I give. I, I, I still, we've been married 33 years. I've known her for 35 years. We will sit in a Mexican restaurant, and they always are gracious. They give you some chips and salsa. So I'll taste the salsa, and she'll say to me, is the salsa spicy? That's a worthless question to ask me. First of all, ketchup burns her tongue. That's, not, that, that's an exaggeration, but Sherry likes things a little bit more mild than I do, and I like incredibly spicy food. So if I try to answer that for her, I always get it wrong. Be, be, because God has, God has made us differently. Uh, th think about uh, sense of humor. See, some of you have different sense of humor. Some of you understand that I'm funny. <laughs> See? Some of you aren't laughing right now. Uh, and, and the people that think I'm funny laughed even harder at that. See, but it, God has made us incredibly, beautifully, wonderfully different. But there are, there are a few things that I think that, that God has hardwired into our souls that we're all the same. And one of those is this deep longing for peace. I don't think there's a single person sitting in this room or in the family worship venue or online with us right now who doesn't just in the depth of their soul long for peace hunger for peace. God, if I could just have five minutes, five minutes of peace and quiet. If I could just have one day where my soul is just truly at rest. And I believe that God has designed us that way by intention because he is the one who supplies that need, that longing, that desire for peace. For each one of us, when we think about peace, different pictures can come to our mind. You think about the, some people think of sort of the end of war. Think of the end of World War II. This picture is, is one of those, you know, it, it's over. War ends. No more war. There's peace. And on a national level, on an international level, people say, finally, peace. And, and, that's, and that's a great picture. And that, 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 that's a great longing for, for that, you know, that kind of peace. Absolutely. And then there's another picture you could have. Some people that lived through the 60s would have a picture of kind of the, you know, Hey, peace, baby, you know, uh, freedom, throw off restraint, do what you want, and, and, and that's, that's the source of where you're going to find peace. For other people, what they think of when they think of peace, it's if I could just get along with other people, if, if people could get along with just kind of locking arm in arm, walking hand in hand, and saying, I have relational peace, a sense of, a sense of harmony among human beings. And, and, and there was, when, I was, when I was a young kid, my, my family got a color TV probably five years after everyone else on our block 
My dad said, the TV we have is fine. There's no need for a color TV. Anybody else have a dad like that? It's like, this one's just great. But, um, but, but we, you know, I remember when I was a young kid, this commercial came on. This commercial that had this, had this sort, of, sort of global, peace-centered, beautiful message. It starts with one person singing and other voices join in. It's almost the revelation of every tongue, tribe, and people, people from every walk of life. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And it builds, and there's this kind of this, this sense of bring the entire world together, harmony among human beings, so that finally, ultimately, the message we can all do what? Drink carbonated sugar soda. <laughs> really? That's, I mean, that, that's the climax. Of the, if you haven't seen the commercial, go online. You can watch it on YouTube. It's, it's like, it just builds a sense of you know, world peace and harmony so we can drink soft drinks together. I think there's more. Right? I think there's more to God's design than that. But, but, but within all of these pictures, here's, here's the thing. Uh, ultimately, we have to come to a point where we say, Lord, is there more than this? My, my heart and my soul and my very being is longing for peace. God, is there more than what meets the eye? And I want to pause right now and just ask God to speak to us on two levels. If you're already a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, and many of you have, I want to pray with you that you will have a new vision of peace, a new picture of peace. And if you've never received Jesus and experienced the peace of God, I'm going to pray that this would be the day that your heart would be open to knowing Jesus. Will you pray with me? Oh God, wherever we come from in our walk of life, as, as beautifully different as you've made us, there are some things that all of our hearts and souls long for. And, and Lord, this is one of them. We long for peace. We yearn for peace. We hunger for peace. And it seems so hard to find in this crazy world. I pray for those that know you to discover the source of their peace and to hold to it with greater strength and to walk in it with greater joy. And I pray for those that have never experienced the peace that only Jesus can offer. I pray their eyes will be open to see this gift today and their life will never be the same because they heard your message today, a message of peace and hope in a world that still desperately needs to hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna read a passage uh, from, uh, from, really, word, words from the mouth of Jesus, from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, a powerful chapter of the Bible with all kinds of lessons. I was reading it this week and just struck by how many powerful truths come through John 14. But the one I wanna think about, and I just wanna ask you, it's not gonna be on the screen, you don't need to open your Bibles to this right now, I just want you to listen to, to the statement of Jesus. And, and understand, Jesus, Jesus has already gathered with his disciples, he's given the last supper, he's broken the bread, he's poured out the cup, he's washed their feet, He's coming near the end of his life, and he's, he's sort of standing in the shadow of the cross and of Calvary, knowing he's going to die and take our sins and die on the cross. So it's after the Lord's Supper, after the Last Supper, and, then, and it's before he goes to the cross. And this is what Jesus says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Jesus, I offer a peace that's different than any other peace you could possibly experience. And the reality is there's, there's lots of things that we sort of strive for and try to organize in our lives and put together so that we can experience peace because there is this longing in us for peace. And, and, and I call these different things that we're striving for nice but not enough. They're, they're good, they think, things we should enjoy, but I, th I think there's more than this. So one nice but not enough when it comes to peace is this, a lack of war. If we could just be done with war, then I would feel peace inside. Now, I wonder if that's really true, but as I studied, I studied the topic of war this last week and see just what's happening in our world right now, there's at least, at least 60 wars, insurgencies, and armed conflicts going on right now as we sit here. At least 60 around our world. Probably a lot more, but 60 that are recognized on a global scale. In Afghanistan, there's been a war going on for almost 40 years. And somewhere between 1 million and 2 million people have died in those 40 years, many of them civilians. Many of them caught in the crossfire of war. And the Mexican drug war that's been going on since 2006, and, and certainly before that as well, over 100,000 people have died in that conflict. There's civil wars in Syria, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, and other places. It, it goes on and on. And sometimes we look and say, if we could just put an end to war, then we would feel peace. But here's the reality. For many people sitting here, 
you're not in the middle of a war right now. It's other parts of the world. Now, with many military in our, in our church and many military families, you are experiencing war because you have a family member who's off somewhere else and maybe in the middle of those things. But for many people here, we're not in the middle of a war, but we also don't feel tons of peace a lot of times. Should we, should we do all we can to create peace in our world without war? Absolutely. But I don't know if that would give what Jesus is talking about here because Jesus says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. It's something different than what the world offers. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Nice but not enough. A hammock and a refreshing beverage. Some you can picture it in your mind. You're just kind of laying in a hammock. You know, a little table next to you with, with whatever your favorite cold beverage is. I mean, it's so cold that little beads of water are forming on the outside of the cup starting to drip down. And you just take that thing and just take a big cup and you just lay there. Just, whew, no responsibilities, nothing to do. Peace. Or, or a weekend off. Or a week-long vacation. I remember how peaceful our family vacations were when our boys were little and we go skiing as a family. You know, carrying five sets of boots, carrying five sets of skis, putting boots on all of my family members. It was just so refreshing, so relaxing. <laughs> um, you know, I'd have to like, have to like finish vacation to have a vacation, you know? And you go, Where, where's the peace that my heart longs for? If I could just find that quiet place, will that get it done? Well, is that good? Absolutely. But that's, it's more than that. Nice but not enough. Freedom from internal and external strife. If I could just manage my life to where I feel okay about things. If I could just get myself in that place, whatever, you know, that emotional place. I'm feeling good about myself. I'm feeling good about things. You know, if I could just get my finances in order so I'm not struggling with making ends meet. If I could just you know, have my relationships be good. If I could just put all the pieces, get those pieces together in my life, then I'll find peace. Oh, oh. And if I can get the people around me to behave themselves, right? <laughs> have you ever noticed that other people have power to steal your peace? I've got this three wood up here because uh, one of my peaceful places is I love to golf. And ever since I started golfing, I started golfing my last year, uh, my first year of seminary, so it's been a long time, I started golfing, and I find golfing incredibly relaxing. Some of you golf and don't find it relaxing at all. I would suggest you find another hobby. It's not really smart to do something consistently that drives you crazy, but I actually enjoy golf. And I've only had two rounds of golf I didn't enjoy in all my years of playing. And both times, I didn't enjoy that round of golf because somebody else behaved badly. One of those stories. I'm out with a friend golfing, just two of us. It's a par five. I tee it up. I just ripped the ball down the middle of 320, 330, maybe 250. Um, and I just <laughs> knocked the ball down. The, but, I, but it was down the middle. I mean, what I'm saying is it was down the middle. And I hit it. And so the ball, I get the ball in play, par five. And my buddy gets over his tee shot, and he tops it. If you don't know what topping the ball is in golf, it's not fun. He tops the ball, and it just kind of rolls off the tee and dribbles about 10, 15, 20 yards in front of him and stops. I'm walking up feeling quite peaceful. He's not feeling as peaceful. Uh, I, I kind of, so he's not, he's not, he's not uh, relaxed when he golfs sometimes, this particular friend. And so he's pretty wound up, and he's, he's, he's muttering things to himself about his ability as a golfer and, and different things. So he's kind of walking his golf ball. So I kind of walk about 20 or 30 yards off to the side and a little bit just to kind of get out of his way and let him do his thing. He takes his three wood. He sets up for a second shot. I'm worried. I'm now worried for him because I don't want him to hit badly because he's already quite upset. And he tops the ball again. It goes maybe 10 yards ahead. And he finishes the swing, continues through, does a 180, takes his, draw, takes his three wood, and he throws it as hard as he can. It flies like a helicopter <laughs> propeller directly at me. <laughs> See, why is that funny? See, that's not funny. I said everybody has a different sense of humor. Some of you are twisted. Okay, so, so he, and it literally, it's, and, and, I, and I duck and I feel and hear it fly over my head like this, boom, goes by. So he's now stolen my piece. <laughs> True story, we get to the end of that hole. He ends up with a six, which is a bogey. I end up with a seven, a double bogey. Oh I had a great drive. I mentioned that, right? And, and, he, and he says to me on the next tee, he says, isn't that funny? I beat you on that hole. You know, you had a, you had a seven, and I had a six. I said, no, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. I was not peaceful at this moment. I said to him, as a matter of fact, I said, you almost killed me. Well, I didn't mean to. I said, yeah, but you almost killed me. So, so here's the deal. You're on probation for a month. After this round, I will not golf with you for a month. You ever do that again, it'll be the last time we ever golf together. 
because you stole my peace. That's what I said, no. Uh, but this, that, I told him, I put him on probation, and he never did it again, thankfully. Um, but but here's, the, here's the deal. You walk through life, and three woods come flying at you. Problems come, and other people can behave badly, and man, your peace is gone, if that's what your peace is based on. But Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. We may not be able to find freedom from internal and external strife. Some of us want this. We we want to have everything to go our way, all our ducks in a row, and safety on every side. Some people operate where they go, I will not feel peaceful till I have ordered everything in my life to be accommodating to what I feel is peaceful. And they struggle and strive to put things in place. But at the end of the day, That also doesn't bring peace. Here's the question. Is there a peace that can fill our souls and guide our lives with unchanging stability? Is is there a peace that is so real and so lasting and so deep that no matter what happens, no matter what we experience, it's still there, unchangeable? And the answer is yes, yes. That's why we've gathered here today to talk about this, to think about this. Jesus says to his followers, and I'll read it one more time. It'll be up on the screen, and if you have it in your Bible, underline it or highlight it in your Bible or mark it on your, on your Bible app. My peace I leave with you, my peace, my peace I give you. Not your peace, not other people's peace, not the world's peace, his peace. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. It's different than the world's peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. There's these two glorious words in the Bible. They're, they're, they're Old Testament and New Testament. It's the same word, but they're, they're, because the Old Testament is in Hebrew and the New Testament is in Greek, they're, they're different words. In the Old Testament, the word is shalom. Some of you have heard the shalom, the peace of God. This amazing, overwhelming, covenantal, unchanging peace. In the New Testament, the word is irene in the Greek, irene. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul would normally sign his letters at the beginning. We sign letters at the end. In the ancient world, they signed at the beginning because when you looked at it, you knew who it was right away. The apostle Paul would sign his letters, charis kai irene, grace to you and peace. May God's grace be yours and may the peace of God be yours. This shalom, this irene, this peace of God is available to us, is offered to us. And, and this is what God wants us to have. And, and it's, not, it's not a peace that's based on everything that happens around us. It's deeper than that. It's a covenant of peace with God. A covenant in the ancient world was an agreement, sometimes between an employer and employee, sometimes between friends. A covenant was this binding agreement, this heart-to-heart and life-to-life agreement, and God gives a covenant of peace with his children. Listen to these words in Isaiah 54, verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed. When you look at things that look stable, mountains, hills, things are unshakable, right? It says, even if the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, Listen to this. Yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. No one and nothing can take away God's covenant of peace, God's agreement of peace with those who've come to him and put their faith in him. Says the Lord who has compassion on you. Now it's interesting. When Isaiah wrote these words, talking to God's people about his peace, the Assyrian nation were sort of hovering over the people of Israel. They had 10 tribes up in the northern kingdom, two in the southern kingdom, but the Assyrian nation was hovering over them and sort of breathing like this massive war machine breathing down their neck. And God says, even if the mountains be shaken, the hills removed, my covenant of peace will not go away. They're not in an easy time. They're not in a safe time. But God says, my covenant of peace is unchanging, is unshakable. And then Isaiah points to this one who will come this coming Messiah, this Savior. He's pointing to Jesus. He's point- we start next week our Christmas series. He's pointing to Christmas, to the coming of God into human history, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, leaving the glory of heaven, Jesus Christ, the Messiah coming to this world. And so Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, he writes these words. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be the Prince of Peace. Micah also prophesies of the coming Messiah, of Jesus' coming into human history. And he writes it this, he paints the picture this way. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And listen to this. And he will be our peace. And he will be our peace. We want to organize the world so it feels peaceful. But the Messiah will come and he will be our peace. Here's what we try to do. We try to organize everything to make it peaceful, to put things in line, to get people to behave, to have people stop throwing three woods and stop misbehaving and stop. And we try to get everyone to behave. And then we try to get ourselves to behave and do the right things. And then somehow, then we'll find peace. And God says, no, the Messiah will come, the Prince of Peace, and he will be our peace. And when we know the peace of the living God, you know what happens? Then our circumstances, though imperfect, become much more peaceful. Then our world, though war-torn, can, we can still live with peace in the middle of this world. Why? Because he will be our peace. He will be my peace. He will be your peace. This is what Jesus offers. This is what the Messiah brings. This is what our hearts long for. And we're trying to find it by organizing our lives and making everything fit. And somehow that will then create peace in us. When he says, no, let me live in you and be your peace. And that will begin to transform everything around you. That's the heart of God. That's the vision of God. That's the coming of the Messiah. Jesus is our peace and the source of our shalom, the peace that our hearts long for. Jesus is the source of that peace. And so the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter two gives this picture of the most divided group of people he can think of. What he's saying is when, when the Messiah, when Jesus lives in you, then peace is potential outside of you. It starts with Christ in you. He is our peace. And then peace moves outside of you and through you to others. And so the apostle Paul says almost the same thing that's said in the Old Testament prophets. In Ephesians 2.14, he says this. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. Nothing else is going to bring us that peace. Jesus is our peace. Listen to this. Who made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He's talking about these two groups of people the Jewish people and the Gentiles, the Jewish people and the rest of the world. And there was this rift, this chasm between God's people, the Israelites, and they saw everyone else as a separate group of people. And they would look and say, there's no way to bring these together. And yet Jesus, who is our peace, can take the most fragmented of people and relationships and actually bring them together. How? Verse 15. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. This is talking about his death on the cross, paying the price with his death on the cross. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God, how? Through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away. And peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. In this passage in the Gospel of John, as Jesus is coming near the cross, when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives, he says, I'm going to give you a different kind of peace. That's written right in the context of Jesus saying, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to be with you and my spirit to live in you. She says, I will come and be with you. It's the indwelling of the spirit of Jesus in us that gives us peace. And you know, we just keep trying to make things peaceful out here and keep on the inside going, it's just not working for me. And Jesus is saying, it's just the opposite. Start on the inside. The shalom of God is a wholeness of life and of body. This word shalom, this New Testament word irene, it, it, it's, it's more than just things being good out there. It's this deep inner sense of peace because the God of peace dwells in us. The Prince of Peace is our Prince of Peace. 
And he is our peace. And so what begins to happen then is as our, our whole life and even our bodies begin to feel differently when we know the peace of Jesus. Now what it doesn't mean is this. It doesn't mean when Jesus dwells in you, all your colds go away, your aches and pains go away. Now, now God does heal. And we all, we, as a church, we pray for healing in this, at this church. We anoint people with oil. We pray for healing. We've seen God do great works of healing. But God doesn't say, I'm going to always heal everything all the time. The Bible doesn't promise that. But God does promise this. He will be our peace, however our body is feeling and however our world feels fragmented. And there is something about when the presence of Jesus' peace dwells in you. You just see the world differently. It's not that you don't care. You care care more than you ever cared before. But you have this sense of peace because the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, is in you and with you and watching over you. The shalom of God is about right relationship between two parties. This covenantal peace, this agreement that God says, I will make an agreement with you to establish a relationship filled with peace. We we in the church, they call that that connection, that relationship, the gospel, the good news. It's a simple story. And and when I first became a Christian, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. When I first became a Christian, I heard the story of God's love and the work of Jesus on the cross and the forgiveness he offers. When I first heard that story and received Jesus, I just started thinking, I want to share that story with others. I want them to know there's a God who loves them like that. And the pathway, the source of peace with God and ultimately with peace with ourselves and peace with the world comes through the gospel, the good news. And so through the years, I've been trying to find the simplest way to tell the story of Jesus. I've got it down to eight words. The whole story of Jesus, eight words. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. Here's the eight words. God's love, our problem. God's solution, our response. God's love, our problem. God's solution, our response. Here's God's love. Before we ever loved God or thought about God, he already loved us. Even if right now you don't know Jesus Christ, and even if you say, I'm here with a friend, but I don't like any of this stuff, and and I I really don't care about God at all, God will say, that's okay, I still love you. It starts with God's love. We can never find our way back to God. God looked for us. It starts with God's love. But the second thing is our problem. Biblically, there's one word that describes what our problem is, sin. What is sin, biblically, what is sin? Sin is anything we think that we shouldn't think. That's a sin. You ever thought a thought you shouldn't have thought in the last hour? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, every thought we think that we shouldn't think, that's, the Bible calls that sin. Every word we speak that we shouldn't speak, that, we, that was unkind, ungracious, dishonest, that's a sin. Everything we do that we shouldn't do, that's a sin. The good things we ought to do that we just don't bother doing, the Bible says that's a sin. God loves us. But our problem is sin, and our problem with sin, it separates us from God. God is here, we are here, and we can't kind of climb our way back. We can't do enough good stuff to earn our way back to God. It doesn't work. There's not not enough good things we could do. So God is separate from us. God loves us, but our problem is sin. What's God's solution? God's solution is Jesus. Amen. His solution is Jesus. When God left the glory of heaven, Emmanuel, God with us, Christmas time, he was born in a manger, God with us, He never sinned. The only person to walk the face of this earth and never sin. The sinless, perfect lamb of God was Jesus. No sin. And yet they took him and they nailed him to a cross. And listen to this. All of our sins and all the punishment we deserve and all the judgment that we deserve for our sins, it was all poured on Jesus. This is God's solution. The death of Jesus on the cross, he bore our sins, he took our shame, he took our punishment, he took it all willingly and gladly because of the love of the Father. That's the love of God. And then he died. He, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He said, it's finished, he's paid the price. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died having taken our sins. And three days later, Jesus rose again. That's Easter. He rose again in glory. That's the good news. It starts with God's love. We have a problem called sin. We can't get back to God. God has a solution. His name is Jesus. And he paid the price and bore our sins and took our shame and took the punishment. And then finally, our response. How do we respond to that? God offers forgiveness. God offers his love. God offers the work that Jesus did to take all of our sins away. 
And our response is to say, I confess that I know I've done wrong things. I believe that Jesus paid the price on the cross. He died and he rose again. I believe in Jesus. I don't have it all figured out, but I put my faith, my trust in Jesus. And I accept him. His work on the cross, his forgiveness. And I accept him to now become the leader of my life, to become my prince of peace, the one who leads me and guides me in peace all the days of my life and for eternity. That's the story of Jesus. That's the good news. And that's how God establishes right relationship. And then God's shalom, the shalom of God. There's a sense in that word shalom, peace, is true success and fulfillment. He said, I, I finally found the meaning of life. I feel, feel fulfilled. And we strive for that in so many different ways. But when you come to know Jesus and you have Jesus in the center of your life, there is a fulfillment that nothing else will satisfy. There's a sense of success that my, my life matters. Why? Because the one who made me, the one who loves me is within me and he's forgiven me and he loves me and I love him and I'm walking with him day by day. That's success. And that word shalom also is a picture of absolute and final victory. That when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ and the work that Jesus did, there is a sense that there, there is absolute, complete victory. Why victory? What have I, what's changed for me? What have I done differently? Well, I've, I've accepted Jesus, but he is my victory over sin, over death, over hell, over the enemy, over judgment, over fear, he dwells in me, and he is my victory, this Prince of Peace. And so as we close today, I want to invite two different groups of people to pray. First, if you have come to the cross and received Jesus, you say, I was five years old or 95 years old. If you've, you know you've accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to ask you to pray with me that God will help you understand the depth of his peace in a new way. That you'll stop looking for all these other things to make peace become real and sometimes I'm going to change the inside of you and say, wait a minute. If I've come to the cross, the Prince of Peace lives in me. And that you would walk in his peace and know his peace. A peace that will carry you through this life, that will carry you to the grave, and that will carry you into eternity. That's the peace of Jesus. And then I also want to ask those of you today that have never come to receive Jesus. Say, I mean, I've been around church or maybe this is all new for me, but I've never heard that story of God's love and my problem and God's solution and I've never made that response to receive Jesus. I want to give you a chance to do that today. It, it will not be pushy or pressure. It will be a simple invitation. But if you say, I want to know this Jesus, his arms are open. He is the Prince of Peace. He's made a way for you. Will you join me in prayer? I want to speak first to those people who have come to the cross you know you've received Jesus at some point in your past. It might have been a week ago. It might have been 20 years ago. You know you're a Christian. But today, you want to pray and say, God, I want to understand your peace in a deeper way. I, need, I, I just, I need your peace. I need in a fresh new way the peace of Jesus in my life overflowing and filling and granting me peace. If you know you're a Christian, but today you say, I want to pray right now for a deeper understanding of the peace of God through Jesus Christ. Will you do this for me? You just raise your hand really high and just say, I, I, just, I, I need right now in my life. Just keep it up high enough for a moment. Just keep it up high. Yeah. I want to know the peace of God in a new area of my life, in a new way. I need that peace. Okay, fantastic. Just his hands all over the place. Go ahead and put your hands down and just join with me in prayer right now. If that's you, say, oh, Lord Jesus, remind me of your peace. Be my Prince of Peace. Birth deeper peace in me than I've experienced before. Help me notice and see and understand the peace that you've already put within me by your Holy Spirit. Help me walk in peace because you live in me. And then, Lord Jesus, bring that peace out of me to every part of my life. Help me to stop trying to make every life situation right so I can feel peace. But help me hold on to you the source of my peace. And then, Jesus, will you change both what my world is like around me and how I perceive my world. May I walk in peace through every day of my life and into my eternity with you. If you prayed that prayer, I, I trust, I believe that God is going to grow you in a new season of peace and walking in his peace. Now, for those who have never received Jesus, you've never said to him, I want you to be my Prince of Peace. 
You've never said, I confess my sins and my wrongs and I need you. And you say, today, I want to do that. I want to pray that prayer. I want to lead you in that prayer. So I'm going to ask you if you would do this. If you would raise your hand high. So I want to, I'm going to actually, I want to kind of acknowledge you and, and everybody else just bow your heads for a moment. But if you want to receive Jesus for the first time and let him be the Prince of Peace in your life, would you raise your hand high and look up at me so I can actually see you and make eye contact and let you know that I'm going to be praying for you. I kind of want to know who I'm praying for right now. And so just raise your hand if you want to pray to receive Jesus today. And you've never done this before. You say, I want to receive Jesus. Just raise your hand high. Okay. Right there in the very side of the balcony. can't see your hand or if you just don't feel comfortable raising your hand but you want to pray this prayer will you right now between you and the God who loves you between you and Jesus the Prince of Peace will you pray this prayer in your heart from the depth of your soul oh dear Lord Jesus I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace I thank you that you died on the cross that you rose again and you paid the price for all of my wrongs so I confess my sins this day I acknowledge that I can't get myself to you, oh God, but that you have reached out to me. So I take your hand today and I accept you as my savior and the leader of my life. And I pray that you will lead and guide me all the days of my life. Let me walk and live in peace because, oh God, you live in me through Jesus by your Holy Spirit. And I would even dare to pray, oh God, your peace would flow through me to others. Well, God, for all of us this day, we thank you and we praise you that you have made a way in this crazy broken world to walk and live in peace. That Jesus, your peace you give to us not as the world gives. We don't have to live in fear or anxiety. So for those who have known you for a long time, let them grow in your peace. Those who have accepted you just today at the first service earlier this morning and in this service, let them begin a new journey of peace with you. And we will give you the glory. We will share your peace wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we give praise to God today? Yeah. Um,